Good morning, everybody. My name is Brian Gerrish. And I don't know how many is in the hall, because I've now discovered the lights. So I can see a few of you at the front, but I can't see any of you at the back. But that's not a problem. <laughs> ah, I, I was a bit worried. <laughs> and I'm also impressed, because I did see a few people having a really good time last night. And I thought, will they have a hangover? And I suspect there are some. The theme is water. There won't be a problem with me and the laptop and the water because I have a little office at home which is in a, a roof space under two Velux windows. And I was at work one day, not at home, and my son called me and he just said, hello, Dad, shall I empty the water out? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, shall I empty the water out? And I said, what for? And he said, well, you left the Velux window open. And my laptop, <laughs> whoomph. So you only do it once. Okay, now, I've learned a lot from all the things that uh, we've heard so far, so I've thoroughly enjoyed the event. And uh, we're here about exchanging information, and I'm also well aware that last night we ended on a real high. And what I've got to do with you is I've got to group you in a bit, because I want to get you focused on some things. So I'm not going to lose the high, because we will get back again, and I'm sorry it's a Sunday morning, but I'm going to take you down a bit, all right? But we will come up the other side. Thank you, machine. It'll come back. Yeah, we'll see whether it works. Unbelievable. Oh, there we are. Okay, a little bit about me. Uh, because there, there's a few stories going around on the, uh, the internet and the web. But I was a surface ship officer. I was not a submariner. I was a warfare officer, and I was serving in this mighty vet vessel in about 1983. And um, just for what it's worth, this is one of the Todere Leanders, and this bit on the back is a sonar for hunting submarines. And it's a very long piece of string with a piece of hose pipe attached to it. And all it did was listened. I don't know whether there's anybody who's ex-Navy here. You might be cheating. But has anybody any idea what range we could track submarines with a piece of hose pipe with a few listening devices in? Up a bit? Up a bit? Well, close. The maximum range we held a contact was 438 miles. And that's going back in 1983. So one of the things you can be sure of is technology at the moment is moved on enormously. On board, not that ship, but a later ship, we were also getting real-time intelligence. So that was being sucked in by the British and the American intelligence machine. And then it was coming in to specially cleared people on board the ship and you would be receiving raw intelligence about things happening around the world. Now, of course, I didn't realize at the time the people producing that intelligence were producing the intelligence for the picture they wanted us to assume. But what I can tell you is even back in 1985-86, a lot of intelligence material on what was happening in the world was flying around real time. So that was, that was the ship. And this was what we were looking for most of the time. This is a Soviet ballistic missile submarine. This was the sort of submarine that would launch an attack on America. And they'd come out uh, of their home ports and come down through the Norwegian Sea and into the Atlantic to hide. And our job was to detect them and then trail them. So that's what I did. And you paid me for doing it. And it was a very good job. The ship. If you see any pictures about the military on the BBC, I'll focus on the BBC, but the military always portrayed as shouting at each other. Life on board that ship was very quiet and relaxed, and people said, good morning, and how are you? And have you had a good day? And we've got a bit of a problem, or we fixed that. So what you're told and what reality is can often be different things. So a little bit of a plug there for some good times in the Navy. When I came out of the Navy, um, I set up a little business. Most of you, or perhaps some of you, have heard this story. I'll just do it for the continuity. 
But eventually, I tried to get involved helping a local community, creating jobs, skills training, and it was focused around the dockyard area on rebuilding small <coughs> boats. And this was the first one we ever did. That boat we got for 100 pounds. It was a wreck, and a little team rebuilt it. And then we started to get information on HMS Beagle, which sailed from Devonport with Darwin on board and Captain Fitzroy. And many of the local people in that area can trace their ancestors to the crew on board HMS Beagle. So something excited started to happen. And then it all went wrong. Very quickly, the project was closed down. We were threatened, bullied, intimidated. And I'll join the bit up because we know that we got in the way. We got in the way of a big military industrial complex and some people did not want a local community empowered because they, those people were working to shut communities down. And if you get a sense, perhaps you, you live in one of the bigger cities, if you get a sense that your community is under attack, it is under attack. And we got in the middle of it and it eventually ended up with death threats. So we were a bit annoyed, and what we did is we started a newspaper. I'm not sure why we've lost a bit of that to the right-hand side. We'll see what happens. Um, but basically, it was a small news sheet, uh, an A4 sheet. We made it a bit jokey, and we took the mickey out of people. And then it grew, and this is the paper now, the UK column. We've got some in the little market shop at the back, and I'm going to encourage you to hopefully give us a little bit of money for one, but take one away and read it. Because this paper is now going throughout the UK. We can't publish every month. We could do if people would give us a small donation every month. But it's going into Scotland, it's going Ireland, Wales, England, France, Denmark. And they're appearing in America, New Zealand, and uh, Australia. So we know we've got something, and all we said we were going to do is tell the truth that other people wouldn't tell. We've got four injunctions on us for reporting on what's happening with children. So we think this is a bit of a coup, and we'd like to keep it going. Our headlines here, um, this was the previous edition where we were asking the key questions about what, the, what was going on with the money supply. And our paper predicted when the banks were going to start falling. But here we've got 900 billion being moved around. Where did it come from? How is it we haven't got enough to finance hospitals or anything else, but all of a sudden 900 billion appears? And the reason is the money's not real. And this is the biggest financial scam you will ever come across. We are being fleeced. And the politicians across the parties are lying, absolutely lying to you. This is the latest edition. It's hard hitting. We've got a cartoon of um, Gordon Brown doing his goose stepping because he is goose stepping us towards a police state. I'm not just saying that for effect. I believe it and I hope I'm going to prove it to you. So we need to do something about this. And I can tell you this paper is read by the Labour cabinet and has been for the past two years and they don't like it. I assure you they don't like it. Neither does Mr. Cameron. David Cameron is the most dangerous man in politics. And the reason for that is he's being lined up to be Mr. Squeaky Clean. He did spend 680 pounds on wisteria cleaning. We all have to do that, it's such a task. He's also claimed for second homes, but all of a sudden, nothing goes in the papers about Mr. Cameron. He's become squeaky clean because he's the next Cabbage Patch clone prime minister. And we've got to do something to stop this nonsense. And we've decided to target it by calling him a Cabbage Patch doll. Have you seen him? <laughs> if you look at pictures of David Cameron, his flawless face, because he's never had any problems, he is a Cabbage Patch doll. And if you open a Cabbage Patch doll's brain, you open the lids of its head, <laughs> it's true, there is nothing inside, okay? <laughs> it was reported in a tiny bit of the paper 
that about a month ago, David Cameron went for the weekend with the Rothermeers, Lord and Lady Rothermere. Why are they important? So they run a big chunk of the press, the Daily Mail, the Sunday Mail, the Evening Standard, and he went and had a nice little weekend with them. So watch David Cameron, because he's being pushed forward, but he is a doll. When we produced the paper, we didn't know what was going to happen. People started to ring, and people started to tell us things. And we got told all sorts of things about fraud and corruption and bullying and missing money. But the one thing that horrified us was the stories about the children. And these didn't come in in odd ones or twos. They came in in groups, seven, eight, nine. Mothers who'd never met each other, who were in different parts of the country, who might even be in ERA or Scotland or Wales. And they told the same story of having a normal life, and then all of a sudden, things happen. And then their children are taken away. And in the course of taking their children away, social services, local authorities, the police, the courts, lie, falsify evidence, commit perjury in court, threaten people, deny access to proper paperwork, and if the mother, in particular, fights to keep her children against all of that false evidence, they then work to section her. And many of these mothers are being sectioned, or they try another trick, which is that if you want access to your children, you need to go on Prozac. You need to have a psychiatric assessment. But if you do the assessment, we'll let you see your child. So they have the assessment, and then all of a sudden, they've got mental health problems. Now, this is not East Germany. It's not the Soviet Union. This is Britain under Jack Straw and Jackie Smith. And I'd better bring in the Lib Dems, because if you think the Lib Dems are any better, they are absolutely not. So we are in a very, very serious situation because we are very close to a one-party state. All the laughter's gone, I'm really sorry. Can, pig, <laughs> can pigs fly? You're allowed to talk to me because I'm quite friendly. <laughs> can, pig, can pigs fly? <laughs> well, you've got it. If pigs can't fly, swine flu can't be real, can it? <laughs> SARS. Se severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. Do you remember it? Millions were going to die of it. My wife, who's got a bit of medical training, said, isn't it interesting that in medical terminology, severe and acute is the same. It means the same thing. So why would you have Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome? And it's easy, because if you drop severe, it's arse. <laughs> right? So we were, t we were talking language. That was a long A. I'm not sure whether the Americans would have understood that. But it's nonsense, okay? But this, the child stealing, is not nonsense. I'll come on to that. I'm, I'm going to take some questions at the end, okay? So I will give you the opportunity for some questions. You can help me. What time did I start? Quarter past nine. I've got to get a move on then. Right. Have we got a problem in this country? We have. We've definitely got a problem. And we've got to deal with it. We've got to confront evil. We're not allowed to learn and then say, oh, that's a bit scary. I'm not going to go there. Because you are the people who are going to do something about it. We are the people who are going to do something about it. Okay? You're allowed to be scared, because that's normal, but you have to get through it. The troops that go out to Afghanistan will be scared at some point, but they have to do the job. And you're here sat in a very warm, comfortable room. So you're allowed to be a bit scared. It is a bit scary, but we'll get through it. Now, I've got to check you out. What do you know? Do bad people exist? Yeah. All right, that's OK. So who's this guy? Yeah, this is a young, uh, a young Stalin, 1902, I think. And that's him when he grew up, and he murdered millions of people. Does anybody have a problem with that? 
I mean the statistics. Sometimes I get communists in the, or Marxists in the audience and they tell me that really it was quite a nice regime. Okay, um, what about this guy? He's appearing in the papers a lot, isn't he? Un Uncle Hitler, and they're now making little shows of him. Keep going. Pol Pot, yeah. Pinochet, he killed a few. Great friend of Margaret Thatcher's, of course, so it can't be all bad. Idi Amin, we're getting the idea. Bad people exist. They've existed in the past, they exist now. Just because you have nice, comfortable lives and your friends are nice people doesn't mean they're not bad people out there. I was trained, so from the day I joined the Navy, very quickly I'm being told about bad people and how they're going to kill me. They're going to blow me up, they're going to gas me, they're going to do me with biological weapons. We had to go through that. You need to go through it a little bit because then we can fight. How many people did this man murder? Okay, I'll, I'll accept whatever you say. 250 million. Well, we've got a lot of millions on the screen. So who's next? Who's the next man? Oh, well done, sir. I like you. <laughs> there he is. Just because he's British and in a suit and smiling does not mean to say this man is not of the same caliber as all the rest. He sent people into wars that were illegal wars. He is a liar. He's a traitor to the country. And he's part of a clique that's in Parliament. And we know they're not trustworthy, don't we? How do we know that? They steal money. But, oh, I'm terribly sorry. I didn't mean to. Yeah? I think the MPs were set up. I think they were duped. And I think we've got to be kind to them up to a point. Not all of them, because some of them are like this man. But I believe MPs were duped, and I'll come back to that. Here's where we are. We're in a bad place. We've got a government by an elite. Has anybody got any doubt that they're an elite? There was a headline, I think it was The Independent, which had Brown, um, Cameron and Clegg. And Brown said, what we've got to do is make sure the political elite are accountable. What we've got to do is make sure there isn't a political elite. We are there serving the state, aren't we? It doesn't matter whether it's a, fine, uh, a parking ticket or something, the state is imposing on us. And there's no such thing as a fair trial. I do not believe any more our courts are fair. And if you understood what they're doing with the children, you would know that's the case. A little while ago, brilliant. I was contacted for the first time, I will say, by a man in the legal profession. And he asked if I'd meet him, which I did. And he said, I am witnessing judges making unlawful decisions in courts. On one occasion, I challenged the man, and he said to me, if you continue down this route, I will put you in prison. So I have somebody very interesting telling me that there is no justice. And this is the elite. This is the lib lab con. This is the one-party state. These men are unbelievably dangerous. And if you don't know anything about the background of Cameron, you need to find out. And you need to find out about the Astor family that he's connected with and their history. And have a look at Mr. Clegg and see what he really believes in. These men are working together and they are going to betray us. Propaganda. If we didn't have good old Edge Media and Ian Crane, because he's done a great job with this as well, but the media is now being controlled the local newspapers are bought, being bought up, and a lot of them are then being put out of business. The media industry is being regionalized, marginalized, regionalized, because we are preparing for the EU police state. And that's what it's going to be like. Well, it's going to be worse than that because of all the cameras. So if anybody's still got any illusions when I'm talking about a police state, I'm talking about a cuddly police state, I'm not. People die in police states, they get murdered. 
And that's what's coming unless we do something about it. We are party to this. Mr. Blair is party to it. Cameron is party to it. Clegg's party to it. This is torture, a key attribute of a police state. And we, as a nation, have been involved, we are involved in the torture of people. That's the state we've come to. And we need to do something about it. And it's not just the torture, because they're now fingerprinting our children. In fact, we're now having to remove photographs of children from school once the children have left. Why would you do that? Does anybody know? It's easy, because if you get rid of the photographs of the, old chi uh, of the children who've left, you get rid of the history of the school. So when the next generation of children come in, there's no history. They don't know who they are. The cameras. Who is behind the cameras? We've let them go up. Nobody says a word, really. But they're watching us. Who's behind it? We need to find out. Not nice, is it, for Sunday morning? But I'm not here to mess around. I said that in the little introduction in the brochure. I'm going to make you smile again later, I hope. But where will it end up? It's going to end up with this. Because these people regard you as cattle. I'm a special category. I'm a red. That means that when the clampdown occurs, sorry, when the clampdown occurs, it means that basically I get taken off the street first. Okay, so you guys are okay. When I go, get worried. Now, we can do something about this, but we've got to fight. This is the key bit. We can do something, but we need to fight. Now, we've talked about the bad guys. I'm not sure where the feedback's coming, sorry. We've talked about the bad guys, and perhaps some of you look at them as being very powerful, very strong people, very dangerous, very powerful, lots of money. Actually, they're very weak, and they are terribly frightened of something. They are frightened of being exposed to your gaze, to your scrutiny, to your law. And that's why when the expenses thing blew, my goodness, arrogant MP started to fall apart. What happened? Nothing, really, apart from dark secrets suddenly came to the fore. So it was the exposure that really started to hurt these people. And I want, to, you, want you to keep that in your mind. Exposure is a key thing. When they fight, they like to do it from the shadows. And I thought, we need to explain a bit of this. Well, there's a picture for you. It's a sniper. So the sniper's there, he's going to kill somebody. What does he do? He hides. And the aim is he's going to kill from the shadows. Second World War tank there, if you can just make it out, with all the camouflage. Well, I couldn't resist this one. If you can see them right at the bottom, this is a First World War picture, and you've got three Royal Navy coal-burning ships making a smoke screen so they can hide assets or hide themselves. But the warfare, if you can do it, you do it from the dark. The SAS, great tough troops, what's the golden rule? Don't get in a firefight unless you have to, and don't get into a firefight unless you can win it. So the number one rule they're told is don't fight until it's on your terms. Okay. So we keep coming back to these people seem to be very strong, but actually they're quite weak. And this is a little bit different because it's a helicopter firing off chaff as a decoy against ground-to-air missiles. So this is a, an example of when you attack these people, then they do something to try and protect themselves. Yeah? So we know out there there are people. We know the names of some of them. Some of them we don't. We know some of the connections, but what we do know about these people is they're all very frightened of being exposed. If you're going to 
attack a country, you can do it openly, or you can do it by subversion. And this is the definition from the dictionary of subversion. Can you read it at the back? If not, I'll read it out for you. Are you still awake? It's, it's very dark back there, and that's very dangerous. It says it all, doesn't it? Treachery, betrayal, destruction, infiltration, revolt, mutiny, treason. Treason has been committed in this country. We've got the documentary evidence. The police won't accept it. Why not? Because the courts and the legal system are corrupted. We've got a problem because somebody's subverting the country, and you know as you look around this country's falling apart. Well, it's not falling apart. It's being dismantled. So if we can see who's dismantling it, we are well on the way to fighting. But if we carry on like we're doing, you can have all the knowledge you like, but when you try and apply the knowledge, you're not going to get anywhere. We know there's bad people, and some of them came up with this wonderful scam called psychopolitics, the art and science of asserting and maintaining dominion over people. Just have a read of that and particularly the bit at the bottom. Okay. I'll read the whole lot for you. Psychopolitics, the art and science of asserting and maintaining dominion over the thoughts and loyalties of individuals, officers, bureaus, and masses, and the effect of the conquest of enemy nations through mental healing. By psychopolitics, our chief goals are effectively carried forward to produce a maximum of chaos in the culture of the enemy is our first most important step. Our fruits are grown in chaos, distrust, economic depression, and scientific turmoil. At least a weary population can seek peace only in our offered communist state. At last, only communism can resolve the problems of the masses. Not very nice, is it? Now that little gentleman there, Beera, was Stalin's secret, in charge of Stalin's secret police, and he personally liked to murder and torture people on his own account. But that doesn't mean to say he's not intelligent, and he was intelligent, highly intelligent, and he and other people for a very long time have been looking at how they can impose their will on us without us fighting back. Fabians. Tony Blair, chairman of the Fabians, started in 1884 by Mr. Podmore, I think his name was. And what was the objective of the Fabian Society? Anybody know? Incremental incremental socialism. A lot of MPs are members of the Fabian Society. They're not members for fun. They go and give talks. They help produce papers. They do research. They help money into it. And you get a clue from these people, because in the window, I think it's there, their, their actual logo is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Fabians, from Fabia, Fabius Maximus, a Roman general who won his battles by sort of guerrilla tactics, slow keep creeping tactics. So we've got an organization which says it's going to set up socialism by acting as a wolf in sheep, sheep's clothing to deceive people. That's what it says it's going to do, so we assume it's going to do it. And what do we know? We've got all sorts of our MPs members. But nobody asks why. Why was Tony Blair chairman? What did he take out of this organization that he was going to put into his policies? We're all nice people, and therefore we look at other people and we think, well, they must be nice. They must think like we do. No, they don't. They do not care about us at all. We are cattle. It's no good trying to think, mm, why do they think that? You can't think like they do, because 
they are so evil. Can I prove it? Well, before I forget it, do you see what these people are doing? This is the earth, this is our world, this is the globe. And two men using hammers are hammering the world into a new shape, their shape. It's not very difficult, is it? These people are very dangerous, and yet these people are our politicians. Now, if we've got to look at another area, because if we go into the 1920s, so we've moved on from the eight, late 18, um, 1898, in Germany, we had a group called the Frankfurt School. I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce the names. They're all there, Mr. Grunberg. They were all Marxists, sociologists, psychi psychi psychologists, and a bit of psychiatry. And they were torturing dogs to see what was going on. And they were studying how to break a society down by attacking moral, family, and spiritual values. <coughs> they were getting paid. Somebody was funding them. Nice job. What have you been doing at work today, darling? Well, I've been working out how to murder people. Perhaps I used to do that. When Hitler came to power, a lot of them disappeared. They got out of the country and they went to America. And we know that they continued their work in America. Now, somebody mentioned yesterday the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. The Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Germany, the Psychiatric Institute, or Institute of Psychiatrists, sorry, part of their job was to train the people who were going to murder the mentally and physically disabled people. Before the Holocaust got going, in the late 30s, the Nazis, under the eugenics program, started to murder disabled people. I think it was about 350,000, 400,000 altogether. But before they murdered the people, they trained the people who would handle the victims. And that was done in the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute using sensitivity training. And that sensitivity training came out of the Tavistock Institute. Where's the Tavistock Institute? It's in London. We've got to learn some things about ourselves because in our midst we've got some very nasty people and they've been hiding in the shadows. So here we've got the Frankfurt School. If you've never heard about it, learn about it. Go and find out so that you know I'm telling you the truth. But these people were teaching themselves how to use psychology and psychiatry to damage morality, the family, and to effect a spiritual breakdown. Aren't you glad you came this morning? <laughs> now, here's Mr. Lewin, and I just linked him with a few people, but Lewin was linked into the Frankfurt School, and then he ended up collaborating with a Mr. Laurier, and he specialised in that. The artificial disorganisation of behaviour. And once he'd done that, Mr. Lewin went on to specialise in sensitivity training. Sounds nice, doesn't it? Do you remember mental healing? Mental healing means you're healed when you're a communist. It's nothing to do with healing. And this is something else we've got to work. The language came up yesterday. When these people work from the shadows, you can sometimes read a document and you say, that's nonsense. Try reading it as though it's malicious, malevolent. And all of a sudden, you can get another meaning. We are going to help your community means we're going to destroy your community. Yeah? Brown is going to set up a new banking system, which is going to help us. No, it's not. It's going to destroy us. So it's like things have become reversed. But this is real and factual. Their techniques went on to create neuro-linguistic programming. Now, I've been tracking an organization called Common Purpose, but initially I didn't understand quite how it was doing things. But neuro-linguistic programming, what any, whatever anybody says to you, is a form of hypnosis, but you've taken away the obvious signs that it's hypnosis. And it's 
incremental. I get somebody, I can't do it, get somebody for a little bit of time, you can change them a little bit. You get them for a bit longer, you can change them a bit more. It's gradual. But I was delighted because a month ago, I got contacted by two professionally trained NLP men who said we are very worried at seeing willy-nilly use of NLP techniques across the country because in the wrong hands, it can be dangerous. And so they started to teach me a bit more about how the system works. But one of the key things one of the guys said to me was, if you hypnotize somebody in a chair, you can get the average person to do whatever you ask them to. Go and shoot that person, they'll do it. Take your clothes off, they'll do it. But if you use a little bit of neuro-linguistic stuff, and you try and get people to go about against their morality, they won't do it. The morality inbuilt in them is so strong, they won't do it. So what you have to do is you have to destroy their morality in order to get a better effect with the programming. Do you think morality has been destroyed in this country? Do you know where it's going? I'll tell you where it's going. Paedophilia is going to be made acceptable. I can't do it in this talk. I'm going to do another talk on the subject to the children. And if you think I've just made that up, you go and do the research. In Germany, papers are already circulating, suggesting that paedophilia should be made acceptable. And the academy schools, and it's in the paper, I'll come on to that at the end, the academy schools are also looking at this subject. We're at the bottom. This is, I've got to go quite quickly because I've got to get on to a bit. This is where we think we are. We've got these people controlling us, looking out for us, managing us. Well, the answer is they're not doing it anymore. Because a whole group of people called change agents are now coming up with policy. Demos, Bilderberg, Government Foundation, Joseph Roundtree Foundation, the, the Work Foundation. There are hundreds of them, and all you've got to do is two clicks on the internet and you can find them all. They're all funded. Who's funding them? If we know who funds the change agents, we know who's driving the change. The next thing they've done is set up a cuckoo in the middle of society. And the cuckoo is the third sector. And the third sector contains over 1,300 government departments. We never needed these in the past. Why do we need them now? They have a job to do now. And we've linked them to 170,000 charities. That's the figure. Why haven't we got a wonderful country with so many charities? The answer is the charities are false because they are funded by public money. Go to the Charity Commission site, research yourself, and you will find that the overwhelming big charities are funded straight out of the, out of the government pot. So the change agents pump in all the stuff we don't want. These are the people breaking down morality, telling us we need change here, change there, change, change, change. Barack Obama, change. Cameron, what's the slogan? Change. Change is from our reality to their reality. And this is where it's being pushed through. Houses of Parliament are nearly redundant. And then all of the rubbish falls on us at the bottom. So when you hear Blair or Brown or Cameron talking about the third way, they are, that's a coded message. They're talking to these people. Now, if we've got a cuckoo like this and we do something on top of it, we've got a big problem. And into the cuckoo's nest, they've put common purpose. And it's slow, it creeps in. And common purpose is gently messing around with people's minds. It says it's a charity creating future leaders, but it's how it creates the leaders that's the problem. This is the organization. This lady doesn't like me, Julia Middleton, the chief executive of Common Purpose. 
I have it on good authority, she doesn't like me. What they did is set up little cells for each region of the country, and they set up what they call advisory boards in each city, and those advisory boards are senior trained common purpose people, and they look out for other people to recruit. You can't just join. It's a sort of network system, and they form a network through the country, and they're very interested in children, and what they are doing is putting new ideas in their heads. It's just they don't tell them they're doing that. We know it's spread around the country, and one of the things I'd like to encourage you to do in whatever work you're doing, research in particular, draw pictures. You can have files this big of documents. You can't fight a battle with documents. You fight a battle with pictures, maps, charts. So this tells me the distribution. It's roughly correct. Newcastle's been hammered. The red dots are common purpose. I can see the battlefield. The blue dots are a bit of a decoy. They're good people. But what we've got to do is cover the British Isles and Ireland with blue pins. Good people. Once we know where the bad people are, we shouldn't have a problem. Here's Julia. I was a bit unkind because I paused the video at this particular moment. <laughs> this lady who's popped out of nowhere, the Work Foundation Demos, which is Marxist, she now is the chief executive of the charity, she's so upset with me, she's done a Gordon Brown and gone on to YouTube. And she's done four little clips. She's talking about courage, power, humility, and bravery. This is a lady who's never really done anything. She earns 80 or 90,000 pounds a year, which is coming out of the taxpayer's pocket. And she is now teaching nurses, doctors, military, government ministers about leadership. So I thought it would be good, and I'm really keeping my fingers crossed, if I can show you a bit more about Julia Middleton. <laughs> She's got me. Start again. Keep your fingers crossed. I think you do have to be brave as a leader. And I think you as a leader, you have to be particularly brave if you move outside your own space. Because the chances are very, very high that you will make mistakes. You're going into a space that almost by definition, everybody around you will know more about what they're talking about than you do. Um, you might have lost lost the habit of making mistakes. Maybe you've got quite good in your own space. Maybe you're used to being good in your own space and then you move out of it and you begin to trip yourself up and you make mistakes and sometimes you don't mean to. Some, some of the instincts that have served you so well in your own space can almost lead you to do the wrong, the wrong thing. The best example I can give you of this is, um, is, is I have five children and they are all absolutely beautiful sailors and um, all like their father beautiful sailors and I hate the sea and I loathe boats and it is my maternal duty once a year to spend most of August sailing off the west coast of Scotland and a couple of years ago we went out to sea and with hindsight we definitely shouldn't have done it it was a it was a frightening experience that everybody was having a lovely time except me who was utterly terrified and halfway through this trip, my husband screamed to me because Tom was sitting on the other side of the boat looking very happy, about age seven. And um, my husband screamed, tie rope to Tom. And the idea was that if Tom fell off the boat, we could pull him back in. So I scrambled across this disgusting boat and tied a rope to Tom. And then we landed, and my husband said, not the anchor rope. Now. You may find this very hard to believe, but in my own space, I'm quite good. It's called dry land, and instinctively, I tend to do loosely the right thing. When I get out to sea, I never do this on purpose, but almost inevitably, I make a mistake. The kids would tell you that story and many others of disasters on boats that involve their mother. 
Um, and the temptation is to stay on dry land, not to go out to sea where I inevitably make terrible mistakes. But somehow I think you have to force yourself to move outside the space and the land that is familiar, to cope with the mistakes and to forgive yourself for them, even when you tie rope to Tom. Um, and to remember also that sometimes the option of just staying on dry land isn't there, that actually the world will come in your direction. It does require you to move outside your own bubble occasionally, and so you better get on and get used to it. Do you know what that lady did to you? I think you do have to be brave as a leader. And I think you as a leader, you have to be particularly brave if you move outside your own space. Because the chances are very, very high that you will make mistakes. got very quiet. You're going into a space that almost by definition everybody around you will know more about what they're talking about than you do. Um, you might have lost, lost the habit of making mistakes. Maybe you've got quite good in your own space. Maybe you're used to being good in your own space and then you move out of it and you begin to trip yourself up and you make mistakes and sometimes you don't mean to. Some, some of the instincts that have served you so well in your own space can almost lead you to do the wrong, the, the wrong thing. But the best example I can give you of this is um, is, is I have five children and they are all absolutely beautiful sailors and um, all like their father, beautiful sailors. And I hate the sea and I loathe boats and it is my maternal duty once a year to spend most of August sailing off the west coast of Scotland. Yeah. Yeah. And a couple of years ago we went out to sea and with hindsight we definitely shouldn't have done it. It was a, it was a frightening experience that everybody was having a lovely time except me who was utterly terrified. And halfway through this trip, my husband screamed to me because Tom was sitting on the other side of the boat looking very happy. About age seven. And um, my husband screamed, tie rope to Tom. And the idea was that if Tom fell off the boat, we could pull him back in. So I scrambled across this disgusting boat and tied a rope to Tom. And then we landed. And my husband said, not the anchor rope. Now, you may find this very hard to believe, but in my own space, I'm quite good. It's called dry land, and instinctively, 
I tend to do loosely the right thing. When I get out to sea, I never do this on purpose, but almost inevitably I make a mistake. The kids would tell you that story and many others of disasters on boats that involve their mother. Um, and the temptation is to stay on dry land, not to go out to sea where I inevitably make terrible mistakes. But somehow I think you have to force yourself to move outside the space and the land that is familiar. to cope with the mistakes and to forgive yourself for them, even when you tie rope to Tom. Um, and to remember also that sometimes the option of just staying on dry land isn't there. That actually the world will come in your direction. It does require you to move outside your own bubble occasionally. And so you better get on and get used to it. Okay. Now, you might not have understood all that. I think you do have to be brave as a leader. Away, and I think you as a leader, you had... You might not have understood all, all of the things in that video, but you'll get the opportunity to see it again, and you can go through it slowly. I did not do the analysis. That was done for me by a neuro-linguistic master pr practitioner who contacted me because he's been following the work we've been doing on exposing common purpose, and he said he is desperately worried about people being trained in neuro-linguistics. It is mind control. Absolutely. And what we know for certain, because even the practitioners, if they're proper practitioners, admit it, if you go and accept hypnosis to say, give up smoking, there is about a 1% chance that you can have an adverse effect. That might be very minor, or it could be a long-term depression. There is a risk to hypnosis, and the good hypnotist will admit that risk. But their skill is, if somebody shows an adverse reaction, they get a chance to try and bring them out of it properly. Neuro-linguistic programming is hypnosis, but Mr. Grindler, Grinder, sorry, did psychology, also worked for American Special Forces. Nice man. They were looking at how to implement the hypnosis without you realizing what was being done. And with neuro-linguistics, you are talking about a 2% chance that if it's done to you, one, you don't know it's done to you, but you can have an adverse mental effect. Are we noticing children committing suicide? Now, it's not just Common Purpose doing this, it's other orgi organizations doing it, but these techniques, creative visualization, neuro-linguistic programming, creative theory, sensitivity training, diversity training, empowerment skills, are increasingly using this neuro-linguistic pro programming. What is significant about Common Purpose, and I have to qualify this here, of course, I can't say that's what she's doing. What I've presented to you is an analysis, an independent analysis by a fully qualified NLP person to say what she's doing. 
I just have to do that because that's what I need to do. But the man says what he's watching is NLP. And what Julia Middleton and her organization are doing with help from public money, and originally the office of the Deputy Prime Minister, is going through the third sector and the public sector, recruiting people and putting them on courses. And I know there's a gentleman in the audience who has a friend who recently did the course. Now, you are not being told about these people. They operate behind closed doors under Chatham House rules, and they are implementing new policy through people who don't even know they've had the new policy put in their heads. If you think back to the Frankfurt School, and you imagine a very nasty group of people saying, this is a brilliant game. It's like pyramid selling. We train somebody in neurolinguistics, they get a dose, they go and train somebody else. It's network, network selling. But what you're doing is network mind control. And this is why when you talk to people about common purpose, if you challenge them, talk to them about golf holidays, and then ask, are you involved in common purpose in any way? You can see extraordinary things. That stress, cognitive dissonance. I ask, why are you involved in common purpose? They're not expecting the question. I've ambushed them. I can't answer this because we're semi-secret, Chatham House rule. Do I answer? Don't I answer? Stress, and you get a physical effect. Try it. You think somebody's common purpose? Treat them with great respect. They're a victim. Talk, and then flow into the conversation. Are you involved with common purpose in any way? And stop and watch and you will see some amazing things. This lady's written a book. This is terribly difficult for me because I want you to read it. <laughs> Buy one amongst 50. When you read this book, she talks about incredible things. She talks about fifth column, how we got things done by fifth columns inside the House of Lords. She talks about steamrolling, steam rollering over people. People who are in the way with common purpose policy have got to be undermined. They've got to be ridiculed. They've got to be pushed to one side. They are creating a new society. And you don't have to believe me because you can read this book. She thinks bankers are wonderful. All the big bankers. She was recommending Lehman Brothers as the leaders to teach school children about leadership. Good old Lehman Brothers. She uses the phrases... Idiot, useful idiot. We need useful idiots because they can be used. Expert idiots are even better in some ways because we can use their expertise for our ends. She talks about it in here. It gives you the best insight into this lady's mind you could possibly hope, and it's not very nice. She doesn't like the British. She says when we go on holiday, we take all our tin food with us. Nice. I spent two years living in Holland, and I know when the Dutch go camping, not only do they take their own food, they take their own potted plants. <laughs> this is true, and they put them around the tent. Okay? So this lady pops out of nowhere. She gets £500,000, and in 20 years, she's got a network of 25,000 people pushing a new social agenda and political agenda through people who don't even know they've been got. It's dangerous. Who is behind them? Where does the money come from? We know they're connected in with Demos because Julia Middleton was connected with Demos. And we know that Jeff Mulgan, the man who created Demos, was the man who actually wrote the book saying, we should remake charity, The Hidden Hand. So all you've got to do, do you remember the change agents that I had down the left-hand side in one of the earlier slides? Who are the Roundtree Trust? Who is the Young Foundation? Who's Demos? Who's the Work Foundation? Who are the Fabians? These people are in the shadows. It's like the stone. Lift the stone, you see them all. And then you say, who funds them? And if you want fun, phone them up and very politely say, do you mind telling me who funds you? Oh, I'm not sure I can tell you that. I'll have to pass you on to so-and-so. Why do you want to know? Who are you? What's your name? Can I have your telephone number? They are very scared of exposure. 
because the moment you ask about the funding, you come to the big banks. Can we prove, for those of you who've never seen any of this stuff, and it is going to be made fully available, this is just a selection of BBC people who've been common purpose trained. There are hundreds of them. I thought about 500, but I've had a lady in the BBC telling me it's nearly 1,000. And if it costs 4,000 pounds a course, somebody spent a lot of our license money. Are you surprised why the BBC doesn't present real news? Mr. Peston is well up in this organization. Quick one. I can't tell you because I've run out of names from my head, but I'll, I'll come back to questions. I've got to keep an eye on yeah, the time. We'll have like a Q&A. We'll keep an eye on the time, but after. But if people want to come to the middle for the Q&A when we do do it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. They're going to be kind to me. It's good. So here's another list. We, we know a lot of these people. There are thousands of them. And if you go through and see who they are, they are police, they're bankers, they're NHS, a lot of colleges a lot of school children, and they're getting courses, and I'm going to say I'm pretty, pretty confident what they're doing is giving them a nice little dose of neuro-linguistics as well. And you've now got a person who's malleable. You can mould them. You can take them from what they traditionally believed in to something different, the new society. Now, we're going to make this stuff available on my website, Common Purpose Exposed, CP Exposed, you can already see some of it. Now, this is new because I haven't been able to talk about it for a long time, but Common Purpose is now tracking us. So Common Purpose is calling up its graduates in public authorities and asking them to release information where members of the public have asked legitimate questions by freedom of information requests. The public authorities are not allowed under the Data Protection Act to release that material, but they have been doing it, including one police authority. Why do the people release the material? Because their loyalty is to their common purpose colleague. They've joined a club. In fact, the neuro-linguistic man said it's a cult. Now, this is a tiny bit of the common purpose spreadsheet where they've said who the authority was, the local centre for local government, and there's details of a request about common purpose, and then they put the name. So they've breached Data Protection Act by releasing these names. Um, here was a request to South Gloucester University. Here's a request to Norwich Prison. This lady, we've got another letter from her showing she deliberately covered up the fact that she'd released information to Common Purpose. Now, Common Purpose is supposedly a charity, and it is your right, my right, to ask a public body how much they've spent. Devon and Cornwall Police took me a while to get it, but I then find they've spent about 80 grand. Can't remember the figure, it's quite a lot. And now we've got Common Purpose using its graduate network to coerce people into breaking the Data Protection Act. Is it any good us going to the Charity Commission? No, because they are in it. Information Commissioner? No, because our legal system's been corrupted. But here is a charity now spying on individuals who are asking what it's doing. Scary, isn't it? Here's a little email just to prove it. So I've got a lady, Emily, who's in London Councils, and she's talking to Alison Cussworth, and she's part of Common Purpose. Hi, Alison, just to confirm, it is the email exchange below which has been requested under the Freedom of Information Act. Not only was she discussing it, but when we levered this document out of their sticky little hands, they redacted, struck out the key information. This is a charity. No wonder it was working from uh, Prescott's office Here's a letter where London councils say that, unfortunately, we release details. But they then say down here to common purpose, you are not allowed to hold those details. We made a mistake. We released them. You're not allowed to hold those details. You've got to get rid of them. And common purpose refused. 
because it said they'd taken legal advice. We can prove that was rubbish. They also said they'd spoken to the ministry, Minister of Justice, Ministry of Justice. We can prove that's a lie because we got a letter from the Ministry of Justice saying that Common Purpose never asked them for advice. So here is a charity which when you start to pull it apart and ask what it's doing, it spies on you. There's the letter. It basically, um, can't read it without my glasses and I might not be able to then anyway. You just have to believe me on that one. But this is, um, sorry, this is a slightly different letter because this one is where the Ministry of, Def of Justice actually released details back to Common Purpose. So these are the Common Purpose people talking to each other. Now this is a bit different and we only got hold of this about a week ago. This is part of the House of Commons library where they have researchers. And we found this wonderful little paper, and it's from the end of 2008, where they're researching skeptics, Eurosceptics, alleging that Westminster is going to close. And unless we do something, Westminster is going to close, and you are going to be in a dictatorship. These are the topics that they looked at. Westminster to be abolished. The EU will wipe the UK off the map into reg. These are a load of regulations. The Arc Marsh, where we've got the French who are going to be given control of a big chunk of the south of England. Um, data is being collected in a conspiracy. Well, it is. I've just shown you. And then the Common Purpose Organisation. Now, what is fantastic with this document is when you read what the woman has researched, you'll think me big-headed. I don't get a mention. It's really weird. She talks about common purpose, but the website's not mentioned, whereas other websites are mentioned, and she doesn't talk about me, although other people are mentioned by name. And I thought about this for quite a long time, and I thought the reason is because if they pump this paper around with too much information on it, okay, if, if, if this goes around too quickly, sorry, basically, if they put around too much information, then people are learning about common purpose. I tried to find out who commissioned this research and they wouldn't tell me. I'm being chased for time. The police have a memorandum of understanding with the Law Society, but the Association of Chief Police Officers is a private company. This is why the expenses scandal happened, basically because in 1997 a man who flagged up what was happening was forced out, encouraged the MPs to feed from the trough, then exposed them. It's called entrapment. Media Trust being run by Julia Middleton. Her husband is a part of Trinity Mirror Group. But in that list of people, there's everything from the Rothschild Empire to Robert Preston, Sir David Bell, Financial Times. And this is the bad news. Common Purpose has said that what I was saying about paedophiles being in the organization is untrue, but this man who was sentenced recently for a horrific paedophile activity in Scotland was trained by Common Purpose. I don't think they would probably know what he was like before they trained him, but the advisory board that selected him contained a police officer who was also common purpose. Strange, isn't it? The police are using NLP. We can prove it. They're involved with common purpose. We can prove it. Two minutes, because I want to take you to the high side. This is more evidence of the Soviets planning to break down society. Families, what do they want to do? Break them up. That's been available in our paper. It's a 20-year plan. This is some early work I did. Where I know this is not very clear, but I superimposed subversion with common purpose, and I put common purpose on at 1985. I projected demoralization for 20 years, 2005, and five years of subversion and breakdown, 2010. Another document you can get on the website talking about how to interfere with people's minds. But this is the key bit. 
If you want to fight, you've got to recognize the enemy. You've got to understand capability, tactics, I've shown you, and then learn how to stop them. There's only a few bad guys. They've got massive power. They're going to destroy us, and they're going to do it by subversion. They are doing it. And we've got to expose them, because if you have a plan that runs in the dark, when you put it in the light, it doesn't work. We've got to fight what we can deal with. You are now running this wide from GM crops to spiritual things. If you want to fight, you've got to pick your targets. Brian, hang on, I'm so okay. sorry. I've, I've been told because we okay. really have run over. All right. That is the key thing. Just let me do yeah. the next slide. Okay. One more. Yeah, no. I, okay. I, I absolutely, you know something, I, I absolutely understand that. Um, what? I do. It's unfair on the other speakers, so I must yeah. stop, okay? I am very happy. <laughs> Pardon? Okay. okay, if you guys are willing to go right. without the break. If yeah? You... Okay. Thank you. I'll do this quickly, okay? But we can talk about it. We've got another venue for it. You have got to confront evil. You have got to start to read and learn about stuff which you won't want to read about because it's not very nice. But you've got to take yourself above it, stop being scared, learn what these people are doing because then you can fight. Somebody used these expressions yesterday. I scooped them up. I think it was Scott. Politicians don't see the light, they feel the heat, burn their butts. Get into their faces and start to frighten them because they are going to be eaten by the machine as well. Strength in numbers, challenge, be persistent, like the lady on the aircraft. Do you remember that story? Say no and mean it, pray for guidance and mean it. Now, we've got to rebel, but it's got to be lawful. We don't want violence, because violence brings the police clamp down. It's got to be lawful, and that is a correct term. It's legal. We can do it. And you've got to pray, because this isn't just about men and politics. This is spiritual. It's about evil. So do a bit of quiet time. Now, 13th of June, in Euston, in the Friends Hall, which is the Quaker Hall, we've got room for 1,000 people. We want people to come to learn how to rebel lawfully. And we already know that this venue is causing the government problems, but we want it packed. We have got to charge some. <laughs> this is scaring the government, and they need to be scared, because if we can't help them, they are going to be disposed of. This is the odds. My estimate, how many bad people who know what's going on in UK? 500. You can say 5,000. I don't mind, because what we've got to get on the side is the 40 million voters. And if you take it worldwide, I don't reckon there's more than a few thousand really bad people, or whatever you want to label them as worldwide, and we've got 9 billion. We've got God on our side. So I like the odds, but you can't fight till you really understand what they're doing. So can we help you to fight? And if we can, please come on the 13th when I can spend more time talking to you. Thanks very much. Yeah.